6 doesn't have an official study guide because most of the questions for the test come from the homework directly. But there are a few things that maybe aren't necessarily there or you didn't touch on very thoroughly. And so this video is just to make sure that you understand what's going to be asked on the test and what your answer should look like. One of the nice things is this test is set up as mostly multiple choice. So you're given options and you just have to find the right one. So that does help. It's supposed to be pretty quick. Um, without too much calculation, it's looking more at the practical application of data and how we use it. So to start with, it's probability. And all probability is is your likelihood of something occurring. Um, and oftentimes it's expressed as a percent. So if we have these various jello, jelly beans, we have 17 purple, 12 yellow, 21 green, and 14 pink. And it asks, well, what's the probability of you picking a yellow one? Well, that means you need to focus exclusively on, well, how many of the whole, of all of these, what part of this is made up of yellow? Well, 12 of them are yellow. You have to determine, okay, 12 out of how many? So you have to add all of those up. And I should have done this ahead of time. I didn't. And I'm going to be lazy and get a calculator. So 17 plus 12 plus 21 and 14 gives us 64. So 12 of the total 64 jelly beans are yellow. So we need to determine what that is as a percent. I take 12. I divide it by 64. And I get... 0.1875 and then we convert that to a percentage by moving the decimal over two places and 18.75% is our answer. Okay, so then it asks, well, what is our probability of picking a jelly, jelly bean that is not green? Well, that means you need to pick, choose how many of them aren't green. Well, 21 of them are green. There's a total of 64 jelly beans and 21 of them are green. So you take 21 away and you find out that 43 are not green. So if there are 43 that fall into the not green, 43 out of 64, 43 divided by 64 gives us 0.671875. Again, the nice thing, I just picked random numbers on this. You'll have multiple choice and it will round to the nearest whole number. So you're all, it'll be all good. Uh, for this case, we'll just go 67%. Okay. And then what is the probability of selecting one that is red? Red's not an option. So guess what? I have a 0% chance because there are no red in there. There's no possibility of me being able to pick a red one. Okay. Then you'll be asked to find the probability or the likelihood of, you're going to be given a value and you have to determine whether this is true or false. So um, the likelihood or the probability of you making it to work on time is 0.5. Again, when we give those numbers, convert it mentally into a percentage. So you can think of that as 50%. 0.5 is 50%. Is this true? Your likelihood of making it to work on time is 50%. Well, your likelihood of making it to work on time is one option. Okay? How many options are there for how, it can, how you're going to show up to work? Well, you're either on time or you're late. There's only two options. So... Being on time is one of two possibilities. Guess what that is? 0.5, which is 50%. So that would be true. Okay? Um, your likelihood of um, rolling a 3 when you roll the die. When you, well, when you roll a die, 3 is one option out of 6 possibilities. So uh, if you were asked that your likelihood of rolling a three was 20%, is that true? Or 0.2? Well, when I uh, calculate that, it goes 1.66 indefinitely. Well, that's not a 20%, so that would be false. Okay? 
So you just calculate what's the likelihood of that one occurrence out of all of the possible choices. You just turn it into a fraction and convert it. Then if you're given a story problem, there are 600 or 260 students on campus and 74 of them are left handed. What is the probability of you walking by a student and saying, hey, are you right handed or left handed? And then saying, oh, I'm left handed. Well, again, 74 is how many people fall into that category out of the total number of students you're potentially questioning. So you go 74 divided by 260, and we're going to get 0.28. Four six, we convert that. We're just we're just gonna round this to twenty eight percent. Okay, again, it's uh, it's gonna state round your answer to the nearest whole percent. So that's what I did, twenty eight percent. So you have a twenty eight percent probability. Not high, still kind of unlikely, but not impossible. So there's your probability. So we also want to look at correlation. That means the the appearance of one variable and, a connect, and its connection to another variable. So um, when we were looking at this scatter plot here, as the x increases, we can see that the y is increasing. When we, went, when we were dealing with linear functions and we had a slope of 1, it was up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. It basically bisects the, the graph right through the middle of it. If you look at these dots, they align pretty closely to that exact slope of 1. Here, as we increase our x, we decrease our y value. This is called a positive correlation. When the two values both rise together, it's a negative correlation. When one value rises and the other value decreases. Um, I think oftentimes this is used as like an example of car safety. The slower you go, the safer you are. The faster you go, the more dangerous it is. Your safety level decreases. But again, if I think of this as a slope, if I start up here and I go down one over one, down one over one, it's making this clear, straight line. So we only get this when we have a strong correlation, either positive or negative. And this is a correlation of one, or negative 1. X is increasing and Y is increasing together at the same, basically the same rate, um, or, or there's this pairing of how it's decreasing. Um, if you see, so this is a very strong correlation and you know things have a strong correlation if they're positive 1 or negative 1. It's both, not just one or the other. If things are a little further displaced, and it seems a little less cohesive. The lines are, it's not quite so clear. I mean, for here, we'll, if we take that out, okay? It just looks like random dots splattered all over every place. This would, we would say it has no correlation, that there's no apparent rhyme or reason. As we increase in X, sometimes we decrease in Y, sometimes we increase in Y. We don't know exactly because there's not a shape or a direction that is formed by plotting the, the data. So we just want to be aware, strong correlation, strong positive correlation, no correlation, or as earlier we saw, a strong negative correlation. In statistics, oftentimes what did we, we want to note what's being observed. What are we interested in? What are we studying in the different elements related to them? Whatever is being studied, observed, being asked questions about um, is the cases. So if you have a, um, my daughter's going into third grade, so we'll say a third grade classroom, and you're asking all of the kids what their favorite color is. Okay, so we'll say um, our options are color, uh, number of pets, their, um, uh, the number in their address, and let's say... Uh, number of siblings, okay? These are the things that we are looking at and trying to, to learn about. Well, if this is related to a third grade class, it's the students. The students, each one of the students would be a case 
because they're what you are trying to gather this these pieces of information from. Then you have to determine the types of things you're trying to information you're trying to gather fall into two categories: categorical or quantitative. And if you think look at the base of quantitative, it's like quantity, an amount, a number. Okay. Categorical is just going to be just basically if you can't. If it doesn't fall under quantitative, it's categorical. And the other thing that proves something is quantitative, it don't necessarily rely on it being a number, it's that you can calculate a meaningful average from those numbers. So if it's height, age, things like that, you can find a middle of the road height, middle of the road age from all of the cases observed. That is quantitative. If it doesn't fall into that, it's categorical. It's just a, a Category, no meaningful average can be calculated. So if we're looking at color, kids identifying their favorite color, can you, are they gonna give you numbers that then you can find a meaningful average of? No, so color is categorical. If we look at number of pets, well, one kid has two, the other kid has three, the other kid has zero. Can we add all of those up and create, find a meaningful average? Yeah, each household has like uh, 2.5 pets. Well, that is quanti uh, quantitative, so number of pets, okay? What about the number on their address? 305, 1112, uh, 1723. Can we add all of those up and then have a meaningful average? Oh, the average address number is um, uh 1193. Well, that's going to be completely meaningless. So in that case, that would be the number to their address is just a category. It's just this thing that we're observed. Do we have any repeats of the same address number? No. Okay. And then number of sibling, siblings. You can find an average. If one kid has zero, the other kid has five, another has two, uh, and two and all of that, you can find out, oh, the average of the class is about two, two siblings, okay? Um, so number of siblings is quantitative. So if we go back to the kids and their number of siblings example, we can use that to calculate the mean, median, and mode for this set of data. To calculate mean, we just add all of the values up. And then, so when I add all of this up, I have, uh, I have 20, and I put it over how many data points there were. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So I got a total of 20, out of 12. So when I divide that, 20 divided by 12, I get 1.6666666 indefinitely. So we can say 1.67 or 1 and 2 thirds siblings as the median. Or, sorry, not the median, the mean. So the average. So not quite two. Uh, not quite two siblings per kid is going to be our average. Now we need to find the median. Well, the only way you can find the median is if your data is in order from lowest to highest. So we have three zeros. So I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to cross those out so I don't repeat it. And then I have one, two, three, four ones. One, two, three, four ones. One, two, three, four. And then I have one, two twos, two, two. I have a three, a four, and a five. A three, a four, and a five. And I'm going to double check that I didn't accidentally miss something by counting it up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, all twelve are counted for. So now to find the median, I have to find the exact middle of this. Well, if I take 12 and I divide it by 2 to try and find the halfway point, I have 6. But that means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right here, I have 6 below and 6 above. 
So when the middle isn't one number, it's shared, I have to find the average of the middle. So I take the two middle occurring numbers and I find their average. Well, this works out easy. It's the same number on both sides, so guess what my average is? I could have gone one plus one for two and divided it by two, which got me one, but yeah. So the median is, the middle occurring number is one sibling. Now we need the mode. Mode is the most frequently occurring value. Looking at that, I have four zeros. I have three, or sorry, I have four ones. I have three zeros, so that's close, but I do have just one more one. So my mode is also one. So 1.67 for my mean, one for my median, and one for my mode. All right, I have this set of data and I'm going to be asked to find the five number summary. And as a refresher, the five number summary is the minimum value, the maximum value, the median, the middle occurring number, the Q1 and the Q3. So Q1 is basically the median of the lower half of your data, and the Q3 is the median of the upper half of the data, okay? So to start with, I can't figure that out as these numbers stand because they're not in order. So I need to put them in order. So we have a 6, a 9, 11, 12, 12, 17, 17, and 20. Okay, I didn't actually want to do it like that. I'm gonna make this 19. 19, okay, so now I can establish the, mid the minimum, six, the maximum, 20, and now I need to find the halfway point. There are two, four, six, eight entry points or points of data, so I need to find the halfway point. Well, half of eight is four, so if I make a line at four, I have four below, four above. Okay, I do not have one middle occurring number, so that means I need to find the average of the two numbers sharing the middle. Well, again, this one's convenient because it happens to be 12, because that's what's on both sides, so we get a median. Now what I need to find is the median of this lower 50%. Okay, so I need to, there's four entries, what's half of four, it's two. So my middle is located right here. Well, since it's not one number, I have to find the average of the two numbers sharing the middle. Well, nine and 11 makes 20, and when I divide it by two, I get 10. So my Q1 is 10. Looking up here, uh, sharing between, Two points, splitting the upper half in half. I have 17 and 19. I need to find the average of that. Well, what's in between 17 and 19? It's 18. I could add 17 and 19 up, then divide it by two to get 18, but just like what's in between nine and 11, 10 is. So that works. Now what you wanna be aware of is if you have an odd number, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw in this, okay, so we got um, six, Nine, eleven, um, twelve, twelve, uh, seventeen, let's go eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. So now we have two, four, six, eight, nine entries. This is going to change things up just a little bit on how we're calculating values. Okay. So we can still say, oh, our minimum is six, our max is 20, and we find the halfway point. If I have two, four, six, eight, nine, what's half of nine? It's four and a half, which means it falls between four and five. So if I look at here, I have 12 would be in the exact middle because I have four below it and four above it. So 12 is my median. Because 12 has the center all by itself, it doesn't fall into either the lower or upper halves. So we exclude it from counting the Q1 and Q3 values. We circle it and now it's out, okay? We put it there. 
So then we look at the lower 50% of the data and the upper 50% of the data, excluding this one that didn't really fall into either. And we do our same calculations. Half of the middle point of the lower half is there for 10. The middle point for the upper half is here. Now I've thrown an 18, so the average of 18 and 19 is 18 and a half. Uh, you could have added 18 and 19 up, divided it by 2, and you would have gotten 18.5. Or you just ask yourself, what's the halfway point between here and there? And it's 18 and a half. So this is your five-number summary. And it's important to know that this summary, what it's telling you is if we splay this out as, you know, 100% of our data, from Q1 to Q3 is the middle 50% of our data points. Half of our results fall in between the Q1 and Q3 because it was cutting the middle or the lower half and the upper half. And then from there we have the upper 25% and the lower 25%. Hope if I can say it, write it right. So 25%. So we still have 100% accounted for, but the middle the, the box in the box and whisker plots is saying the average or the middle central values, 50%. And then we have a whisker to the left showing the lower 25%, a whisker to the right showing the upper 25%. So we're not going to talk about standard deviation specifically so much in this class. Uh, we definitely don't have to calculate it. You'll get to have that joyful experience uh, if you ever take intro to stats. It really isn't that bad, it's just a time-consuming thing. What we really want to be aware of is what standard deviation means and the values represented within it. So all standard deviation is, is called the central tendency. It, sh it oft as a graph, is shown as this perfect bell curve that if I cut it directly in the middle, it's a mirror image on both sides. And this direct middle has the mean and the median being equal. So the middle point is also um, the average of all of these results. The lower your standard deviation value, say, and, and we don't have to ask ourselves where do these standard deviation comes from, we're just going to be given values. We don't worry about where they're coming from. But if I was given a standard deviation of 1 and a standard deviation of 0.7, that means from this central point, from this point of central, uh, of central tendency, the values are either one value above or one value below. It's pretty consistent. And within one standard deviation is what the empirical rule says is the 68, 95, 99.7. One standard deviation encompasses 68% of the data. So in whatever you're collecting data on, 68% of the results are following, following within one standard deviation of that mean. So if you're looking for, you're looking for consistency, that's what standard deviation is about, is a consistency around this, this mid value. Okay, so one is, is a good standard deviation, but 0.7 is even better because if we'll just pick that this middle number is a 10. Okay? Well, if it falls one standard deviation above, it means it goes up to 11 or it goes down to 9 with a standard deviation of 1. Still pretty good. It's a pretty narrow window. But if you have then a standard deviation of 0.7, that means it's only 0.7 above or 0.7 below. So if I um, add 0.7 to 10, I have 10 0.7, and if I take it away, it's 9.3. This half is a difference of 1.4 rather than a distance, a difference of 2. So it's smaller, so it's even closer. So the smaller the standard deviation, the more consistent your data is. Okay, and then from there, it's going to be standard deviation of 2, means another value below 8 or above, 
Okay, so within one standard deviation are the values of the 8 to 12. In standard deviation 2 is encompassing 95% of the results. Okay, whether it's below or above. And then a third deviation is encompassing almost everything but three tenths of the results. But again, it's taking whatever the standard deviation value is and adding it one or subtracting it one to find out how things are moving away from that central point. So that's what standard deviation means. The more consistent your numbers, the smaller your standard deviation value. The broader the range of numbers, the greater your standard deviation. There's less consistency when you plot the points out. There's greater variation. There's not this beautiful sloping bell. You're going to be given three sets of data to look at and determine which one of these, without having to calculate standard deviation, do you believe would have the greatest variance or spread from that uh, central tendency or that average value. So when we're looking at it, we have an 11, some 12s, a 14, a couple of 15, 17, and 20. Here we got some 14s, 15s, 16s, and an 18 here. We go from 8, 11, 12, 13, 15, 17, 20. There's no real consistency here. So which one of these do we think would have the largest standard deviation, the greatest value, which means it has the largest variation in values, the least amount of consistency? Well, looking at set 3, it goes from 8 to 20. So it has a range of 12, a value of 12. Here is 11 to 20. It has a range of 9. So it has a smaller scope of values that's being spread out. We also see there's a little more consistency in the middle. There's some repeated values. This has one repeated value down here, and then it just kind of splays all the way out. So there's not really any pattern or central balling of data. It's all spread out. So our largest standard deviation value would come from set three because it has the widest range of results. Then if we were looking for, well, which one had the smallest standard deviation? If we look at this, this only goes from 14 to 18. There are eight data points falling between 14 and 18. That's a very small range, and we're seeing a lot of repeats, mostly gathered around this 15, 16 value. So that means there is a consistency. Consistency means a low deviation, and so it's going to have a smaller standard deviation value. You will then be asked to find the median, compare the median and mean in one of these sets. It will specify which ones. And so to find that, you have to find the, it's nice enough, they're all in number order. Um, and so you can go ahead and find the median by just finding the middle occurring point. But then you're also going to have to calculate the average, which means whichever one you're given, you add all those values up and divide it by how many entry points you had, and that calculates your mean. So then you would need to find out, well, which one is bigger? And remember, the open end of the inequality sign always goes towards the larger value. So if you were asked to find what do you think a practical standard deviation value would be for the following scenario, it's really just what you think fits. So we're just looking at the price of new cars. Say the average price of a new car is $25,000. Do we believe that the standard deviation of that, or you know, the, the variation in values from that central point is going to be $10,000? which means from this central point, there is going to be 68% of um, those values are going to be 10,000 more, so 35,000 or less, 15,000. Do we think that 70% of the cars are going to be there? Then if we went up another standard deviation, another standard deviation, another 10,000, 45,000 to 5,000. Now again, think of this as new cars. If it was just the average price of a car was that, 
and you wanted to find the range of cars, then maybe. Generally, most cars are going to fall between five and 45,000. Okay, that would work. Seems a little big though, okay? So that would be a bit too big of a jump. If we looked at a thousand, all right? Again, if we have 25K as our average and one standard deviation, I go up 1,000, be 26K or down 24K. You think 68% of the cars, the new cars out there are gonna fall between 24 and $26,000? Um, and that 95% would fall in between 23 and 27,000. That's, that's, that's a pretty narrow range. So that, uh, that might be too limited. First one's too broad, the next one's too limited. We want that, that Goldilocks thing. One's too, you know, the, oh, Papa Bear's bed's too hard, Mama Bear's bed's too soft, but babies is just right. We want the just right, okay? The in-between. So then if we had a 25K as the average and we went up uh, 4,000, it'd be 29,000 or down 21,000, okay? Encompassing 68%. Go up another four, uh, 32, oh, 33K down to, oh, goodness gracious, 17K. So that 95% of the new cars are going to fall in between 17 and 33K. That seems a little more reasonable. So that's the type of thing that you want to be doing on the test is what seems like a more plausible jump and value of ranges of prices between lower and higher that the majority of everything is falling in. And the last thing to be aware of is how we identify what our graphs show. When we have the lovely standard deviation bell curve, this is this is, well, that's what this is called. When everything is evenly distributed, uh, the top and bottom half are mirror images, this is a bell curve or bell-shaped. If you have this curve that goes up high and then this tail that kind of stretches in one direction, the skew of that is called the direction the tail is on. This is a tail on the right side, so this is skewed right. Okay, because most of it falls down here, but a weird anomaly up here is kind of dragging your average up, even though your mean, um, I'm sorry, your median, your middle occurring number is down here, but your average gets skewed, pulled to the right, because this is a larger value bumping your average up. Then if you have the tail to the low and then the curve on the upper side, then this is skewed left, where the median, mo uh, most of your values or your middle value is occurring way up here, but you have this outlier happen down here that is dragging your, your mean down from the value of your median. And that's the test in a nutshell.